All right, good, good morning. Uh, it's interesting that our, like the state of open networking and edge, in one word, it still travel trees. There are 400 people registered online and a few of us in the room. So you can see, I think the first statement I can make is companies are tight on travel budget, but let's at least uh, take advantage of uh, everyone who is here. And uh, let's go ahead and get started. We, you know, there's it's a fantastic lineup of uh, content. The webinar slash regional day will be up on YouTube under the LF channel for the rest of the uh, forever, I, I think. I, I, I should say, and uh, uh, you you can take advantage of that. Um, okay, I'm going to cover uh, three things very very quickly. In a rare situation where some of you don't know what we do, uh, it's worth noting because we keep changing and expanding our role in the ecosystem. So I'll talk about the Linux Foundation. Um, we have seen a tremendous amount of, uh, the term I use is open sourceification uh, in vertical industries. We had published a white paper called Software Defined Industries some time back uh, that included industries like telecommunications, energy, finance, automotives, right? 100 year old industries. So we'll talk about those. And then bulk of the presentation is, is on networking and edge. Uh, I won't need the entire time so we can take questions both from the chat and, and from the room. All right. Um, we are over 850 projects and about 60 sub foundations and we are well beyond Linux now. Um, either a sub foundation is organized as a technology area, so security or blockchain or edge and IOT, etc., or it's organized as a market, uh, whether it's uh, networking or telecommunications or cloud or, or film or energy. And in those sub foundations, we have projects that we host for which contribution happens and we uh, we, we get code and we get community participation and everybody benefits. Um, the, the big ones um, have, have a broader community support. Uh, things like OpenSSF, right? Um, OpenSSF, networking, cloud, um, they're kind of the big one. Risk five, you can see from a hardware perspective is, is large. Uh, LFAI and data is, is quite large. Uh, both in terms of community projects and uh, the size of the foundation or sub foundation. Uh, and then of course we started this endeavor on doing standards and specifications uh, several years ago and it has grown significantly to a point where we can't keep up. Uh, so if you have specifications or standards that you need to do, um, it's a one-stop shop in the Linux foundation. Um, that includes licenses um, for uh, the data and data governance, like so you can see CDLA in this world of AI that I'll talk about in just a bit. Um, licensing and sharing of data is very important. So CDLA is the equivalent of Apache 2 on the software side. So, you know, take a look at that as well. Okay, so with that said, today it's focused on networking and then edge and IoT. Uh, and that's kind of where bulk of the presentation will be. All right, so let's talk about the open sourceification of vertical industries. Um, we've seen this before. Markets are huge. Edge is four times the size of, of cloud, and it is growing with the help of 5G, not just 5G, but there are alternative technologies that I'll talk about that affect all verticals, including manufacturing, healthcare, energy, et cetera, et cetera. However you slice it, right? Whether you slice it in market size or the impact or applications or use cases, doesn't matter. It's very, very critical. So people who missed the cloud computing revolution, right? Like Kubernetes took over the world and cloud took over the world. Uh, 
uh, don't feel afraid or don't feel shy. Edge is next, um, in the next. And this is, by the way, 2030 numbers. So really, really good to know. All right, so how do we see the uh, ecosystem evolving? So we host all these projects in um, networking and edge, which is a few of these are listed down below. I'll go through this in detail. And then these projects come together in some version of a blueprint. Either it's a blueprint or a super blueprint. Now blueprints are not just a marketing term. They're actually declarative configurations with CI, CD, with documentations, with open scripts, open um, test results that you can actually reproduce if you want. And, and it just helps speed up the deployment very, very quickly. It does not replace vendor support, but it does accelerate kind of the boring part of the journey of putting open source projects together with hardware and software. And they could be proprietary hardware, proprietary software, but blueprints include everything. And so when these blueprints come together, then they are either funnel based on use cases into an enterprise market, into a service provider market, which could be both cloud service providers and enterprise service providers, oh, sorry, um, telecommunications service providers. And then um, end users like the US government, we're looking very closely on a lot of EU things going on here. Um, and then there is very specific um, verticalization happening in each of these markets, right? Industrial energy oil. Now, one thing that our community has come back and realized is each of these verticals from an edge and IoT perspective are done in this particular order. So if you look at kind of, you know, industrials is the hottest, most important market for edge and IoT right now. And the reason for that is they have the highest uh, need for the use cases in, um, in edge computing. Then energy, then uh, retail, home, etc. This doesn't mean that these things on the right are not important, but they are taking a lot longer because of you know, regulations and processes and compliances and things like that, okay? But we are seeing the first five at least go very, very fast and adoption has, has gone up significantly. You will hear from one of our uh, premium members, you know, Zedera and uh, Arm also talk about some of these deployments and some of these innovations that happen at the edge um, on some of these uh, verticals. Uh, so at the high level, we're seeing vertical adoption significantly increase, but it's all fundamentally being built on, on open source projects. Okay. How does that work in a global setting? We are not operating in a silo. So five years ago, maybe even seven, uh, there, was a, there was a statement made by someone in some keynote saying open source is the de facto standard. And that kind of upset quite a bit of people in the telecommunic telecommunications world where standards are like there for the last hundred years or whatever, right, since the telephone was invented. <laughs> And so we actually went out and proactively worked extremely closely with our standards partners, GSMA, Etsy, 3GPP, you know, more recently, Oran Alliance, NGMF, NGMN, TM Forum, MEF, et cetera. And we also worked with our open source counterparts, which play a different role in the different areas of the stack, whether it's part of the Linux Foundation, whether it's outside the Linux Foundation, like Open Infrastructure, o Open Infra Foundation, or OAI, or, or, or Eclipse, and any alliances that were particularly important to the vertical, right? AECC, Auto Automotive Edge Computing, IIC, or Digital Twin Consortium. Um, and, and we also uh, worked with them not only to uh, define the scope of what needs to be done, but also announce and partner publicly so that standards and specifications and code are harmonized, okay? For those of you who are not familiar with this, there's a white paper on harmonization. It's a little bit old, but it's still valid because there's, uh, you know, in, in, its, in its simplicity, the, the message is very simple. If there's a standard, code to it. If there's no standard, 
code to it and upstream to a standard. And how you do it is part of the, the, the puzzle that our community now has figured out how to do. And so we're really excited that this has continued and this has led to the tremendous adoption of edge IoT and networking um, software, open source software into deployments. And we're not even tracking any deployments these days because there's just a lot of those, right? Uh, across all geographies, whether it's China, US, Europe, right? Whether it's, you know, Deutsche Telekom or Orange or whether it's AT&T, Verizon, China Mobile, China Telecom, they all have put open source software in production and they've been running it for quite some time. And it is aligned to the standards very, very closely, okay? So the big thing is this was a problem three years ago. It's no longer a problem. In fact, it's an asset these days, okay? We're gonna significantly expand our partnership with Etsy uh, coming very soon. So, you know, stay tuned on that as Etsy goes out and, and looks at some of the other uh, areas as well. The other thing I want to point out is on the LF Energy, energy Sub-Foundation. So a lot of, um, so I also run the LF Energy Sub-Foundation for, for the LF. And one of the things we have found is LF Energy or the energy distribution globally is following telecommunications exactly but they are three years behind, three to five years behind. They have the same concept of a core edge and access. They have the same concept of regulations. They have the so same concept of how data resides, how, how the uh, uh, traffic in their, in, in their terminology, you know, electricity uh, changes. Because if you remember, you know, when YouTube and user-generated content came, the entire traffic management on the network had to change because the traffic was flowing up rather than down. Similarly, a lot of creation of power is being done in solars and alternatives, and it's causing a lot of challenges of orchestration and automation. Familiar? Yeah. So there's a lot of cross-pollination between our edge IoT projects and the energy projects uh, that, that lead to a lot more sustained commonality across these these uh, systems. And by the way, a lot of these utility operators, they have purchased a 5G private network for a lot of their own uh, deployments, which by the way, is built on the tele telecommunications network. So you can see industries are blurring lines, right? Just like we have seen uh, the cloud and the telco industry kind of blur lines, these verticals are blurring lines, thanks to the standards and, and alliances here. Okay, so with that, let me go into the uh, networking and edge. So this is my, like for those of you who have heard me for the last decade or two, I always have this slide, right? So it's one of the oldest slide, but it keeps getting better and better and better, right? Um, and the reason for that is it gives you a bird's eye view of where we play, where are, and these are just sample projects, right? So. After years of kind of um, uh, what I call uh, collaboration with a lot of uh, companies globally, we have finally managed to get in everything end to end in an open source way. So if you want to build a network today, end to end, including access, alternative access, edge and core slash cloud, you can do it and let me show you how. The last thing we had launched was what is called LF connectivity. So it includes everything other than the 3GPP or RAN access, okay? And you can see LF connectivity right here in the horizontal part. So it includes the last mile enhanced access for rural and highly dense urban areas, right? So 60 gigahertz, projects like Terragraph, very popular. Uh, there's a project called Maverick, right, which is a AI-based RIC, uh, intelligent RIC algorithm, right? They use digital twin technology to, uh, to, de to, to plan out the network before they deploy the RAN. So extremely interesting projects. There are five more coming. Uh, LF connectivity uh, was announced, and it is an integral part of the overall uh, solution. 
because if you see most of the uh, most of the um, telcos focus on the RAN, and we host the ORAN Alliance software project here at the Linux Foundation. And then you move to the edge, obviously some of the large projects like EVE, Fledge, EdgeX Foundry, Acrano, they all reside here, coming in from the enterprise side of things across any vertical. Um, and we'll talk about edge in more detail in just a bit. And then obviously through the clouds, you move up the stack, any cloud, you have the Gnosis. We have some very powerful projects, uh, Sonic and Dent. Um, Sonic is kind of a data center NOS. Dent is the uh, distributed edge campus retail NOS, right? So Dent source code, our lead was Amazon retail. Sonic was Microsoft. So you can see two of them coming from different perspectives. They're all in deployment today. Uh, and then you go up the stack with Kubernetes, FDIO, DPDK, sort of the data plane. And there's really two ways to build the stack up. Okay, you can go the traditional route through FDIO, DPDK, VPP, for those of you who are familiar with that, uh, OpenStack, OpenDaylight, ONAP, et cetera, up the stack. Um, and then in a hybrid manner, you would do it with Kubernetes and OpenStack together. In some of the green field, you can start off with straight cloud native um, in either way. Um, and so that is kind of the uh, stack up uh, whether it's a telecom core or a cloud. Um, and the most recent addition is Nephew, which I'll talk about in a bit, um, which, which just issued its first release, very powerful project. And then you have um, all the eBPF, which is kind of the, um, the um, uh, e I don't know how many of you are familiar with eBPF, but it's, the, it's, a, it's on top of kernel and it, it's an alternative way of uh, building the entire stack uh, with applications like Leaf as part of LF networking. And then you go up the stack and you have two very important projects here in the EU, Kamara and Silva. Uh, so tomorrow's keynote, I'll make, I have a couple of announcements on that. I, I didn't realize this was before the keynote, so I can't leak out any information on the two, but just join the keynote tomorrow. I'll be there on the stage and we'll have some good announcements on both of those. Uh, and then on top, you have all the uh, applications, right, or CNFs. So this is a very important diagram. We just keep on adding to it. Uh, it has not changed for the last 10 years other than getting rich, okay? Which means when PowerPoint slides get used again and again, they must be right. That's what I believe. <laughs> okay, so then double click on Edge. And for those of you who have not heard my monologue on Edge, you know, please listen carefully. In the last three years, we have completely butchered the definition of Edge. Thin Edge, Thick Edge, Far Edge, Near Edge, Cloud Edge, this and that. And they're all relative terms, okay? And we need, we've, we've, we're done with them. So our LF Edge community went in through both State of the Edge as well as White Paper and they defined the terms and they defined it in a Wikipedia style definition, okay? So for those of you who are participating in edge computing, please use these terms because people will understand what you mean. So there's only two types of edges. There's a user edge and there's a service provider edge, okay? User edge is dedicated and operated by a user Service providers is shared and as a service. It's not a hard cut, as you can see from the bottom line, but typically the last mile separates the two. When you go to user edge, it has three implementation options, okay? From all the way at the end is constrained device edge, microcontrollers, embedded compute, right? There are constraints, and this could be in any industries, right? Turbines, windmills, industrial, doesn't matter. From there, if you have a little bit of space and you have your wiring closet data center, you have an IoT gateway, you have a smart device edge, and then you, you can also have a broader, larger on-prem data center edge. But in all three implementations, the user is the controller of the edge, okay? And I think I'm not defining, people know why edge compute is relevant, right? 20 milliseconds or less of latency and all that good stuff. So I'm not even going to go there. 
Then when we get to the access edge, this is, this is either below the base station's RAM or in a smart central office, and that's it. After that, it is not edge compute. So if a sensor wakes up every week and dumps data in a cloud, that's an IoT application. It's not an edge application, okay? And so we at the LF Edge sub foundations have, you know, over 10 projects, very, very important projects that range from infrastructure to applications in various stages. And they solve very particular use cases for these vertical markets, okay? And uh, the, the big ones, obviously, I pointed out EdgeX Foundry. It's an IoT framework um, that runs on an IoT gateway. Fledge, it's the same framework, but for constrained IIoT implementations. Eve, which we'll talk about today, uh, has an implementation on the, uh, on the Edge virtualization engine side. Uh, and then you have a Crano, which is a very interesting uh, pr uh, integration project, but it also has a lot of blueprints uh, that that have been, you know, deployed. Now we are at release six, so I don't need to talk about it, but some of the latest blueprints are fully integrated, declarative configurations. You can go to the wiki today, download it based on set of hardware, set of software, and by the way, um, based on use cases, most importantly. So whether it's, you know, vehicular topology prediction, whether it's, uh, um, you know, the, another good one is the PCIe or public cloud edge interface right, right there, uh, you know, which is an Equinix uh, contribution, uh, etc. There are, there are smart connected vehicles. There's a lot of good blueprints. And remember, they're all in different implementation areas of the edge, okay? So, I, you know, I just want to make sure that as, as you participate and build blueprints, uh, you understand if it's there, enhance it. If it's not there, you know, expand it. Okay, so with that said, what are the three most important things this year and maybe halfway through next year? The first is NAS. A lot of work has gone on to network as a service and we at LF Networking have been focusing on that. There's a white paper that has come out and it includes everything from the OSS stack all the way to the management framework and a lot of projects need to be put together. So there's something called LG, uh, LF and 5G Super Blueprints where you can participate and know a lot more about it. So NAS, very important this year. The other thing that is important is AI. And I have not put any AI on my LinkedIn yet. I want all the marketing people to finish explaining what they read on, read on ChatGPT first. And then we'll get to the real stuff, right? Because we've got real data on what AI is and what needs to happen. And this chart actually captures that very crisply. And we have done surveys of our Linux Foundation networking board, LF Edge board, LF Energy board, on what's the most important thing on this. So let me take a little bit more time on this and explain um, how we are approaching the AI problem. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with, with uh, you know, the whole LF AI initiative, um, about five years ago, I think um, Jim and myself and a couple of others, we launched LF AI and data in China and it's grown there significantly. Now Ibrahim runs it. It's a very, very important entity, but it's a horizontal construct. It's a generic horizontal construct. It does not include any domain specific requirement. Let me make sure that we heard this clearly. No domain specific AI work or data work will happen in LFAI and data. All the domain specific work will happen in either LF networking, LF edge, LF energy, you name it. And what does that mean? Start at the bottom, the network infrastructure. So you saw the projects and the whole blueprint stuff. Use all of that. There's a lot of vendor solutions in there, but let's say open source projects plus vendor solutions. And then you, on top of that, you have domain specific data sets. So network is rich in data, but that data 
cannot be shared outside an AT&T or a China Mobile and all that. So how do we solve that problem? So our, our board is working very cleverly on that and you know we'll, we'll have some answers to that on how do you bring out data to solve the domain specific problem. Um, that's one big challenge. The next two are the AI models, which are generic. So, you know, there'll be a lot of announcements on these generic LLMs and things like that this week, but stay tuned on that. And then there's the data and AI infrastructure. So why do I separate AI infrastructure? Because there's a lot of computing elements, GPUs, that are outside the normal network, okay? And that requires sharing governance and processing, all of it. And, 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 and it is important on how data is stored and, stored and shared. So a lot of this uh, is, is new and it is being implemented by generic cloud providers, generic enterprises, things like that. And then when we get to our own, which is either an edge or networking, you have domain specific models. For those of you who remember a project called Acumos four years ago, it was a telecommunications visual AI recognition project, which was under LFAI and data. And what it did was it took pictures of the base station and through clever AI algorithms figured out that you need to send a technician because there's some damage. Okay, beautiful concept, exactly what happens these days, but way ahead of its time, okay? There are much more interesting tools now. There are much more better algorithms now. And so we're gonna utilize all the visualization techniques in the domains itself. So there's a AI domain specific model that, uh, you know, and it, it just doesn't have to be LLMs, right? People just confuse LLMs. There's a lot of other things that are happening. And we will give out all the results of the survey in just a or a month or so as we finalize all the all the solutions. And then you have on top, which is the most important thing, which is AI use cases. And we have narrowed down, we as in the LF networking governing board and our members. And for just a sample, if you look at the CapEx spending globally, top eight or 80% of the top 10 are part of the LF networking ecosystem, right? So you're now talking about 80% of the money that is being spent uh, that has uh, given us the feedback and on, on which use cases are important and we'll publish them. And that's why I said, I'm trying to wait for the hype to die, die down because we, you know, once, once everyone wants to put things out, then, then the real stuff starts. And the real th the stuff is not gonna uh, show up in the network this year probably next year, okay? It takes some time on the network side, okay? So that's on the AI, uh, very important. Uh, same thing I didn't put up on the edge. We're doing a, something similar in terms of use cases, domain specific. There we have a little bit of a wrinkle because the domains are also vertical industries uh, because we have to customize for that, okay? And then the third most important thing is 6G is right around the horizon. New requirements come in, 6G has an AI element embedded in it and the, the community is looking at this from a very forward-looking perspective. Okay, I won't go into this here. All right, with that said, a little bit of just momentum, right? Because you always want to the right and growth. So we're seeing pretty good growth on almost all the projects. Um, the oldest one, obviously, DPDK, this is like in the 10 years of its history. And some of the new projects uh, are also seeing a lot of growth. The big one this year we'll, we'll see is Oran. A lot of work is happening in the software community that we host, okay? Another focus area for us is security. And we were just recently at the White House. I don't know how many of you saw the post, but um, we hosted a seminar, uh, OpenSSF hosted a seminar on, on critical infrastructure. Uh, unfortunately, I could not go, but we were represented by Jim and, and Omkar, our, our uh, peer on uh, OpenSSF. And the discussion was how to secure open source and how to se secure critical infrastructure of open source. This is on the US government side, right? DARPA, DOD, and all the 17 agencies. 
There's similar effort happening here in EU, um, and we'll talk about that with you know Silva and other projects, uh, where security requirements are being put right into the open source projects like Silva. But the thing on security is, if you can't see it and you can't measure it, you can't solve it. And so we have a dashboard um, under lfx.security, and you can go into any project under the LF and see where um, these projects are in terms of their batches and their best practices. So for example, ONAP is silver. Silver is to a point where it's probably 180, 190 checklists and pro processes and documents and do you do this? Do you have a CI CD? Do you do this? Do Tremendous work that gets done. All the way to SBOMs. Okay, automatic generation for S-bombs. S-bombs are going to be extremely critical in the world of CRA here in Europe as well. Um, and so ONAP, projects like ONAP are, are there. Other projects are on their way. But you can see that not only CVEs are being solved, but also a lot of uh, security uh, processes and implementations are happening. Okay, and then there is a white paper, obviously, to, to uh, read a lot more on that. All right. So then what is a practical use case to put it all together? And that's called 5G Super Blueprint. Now, who's the user of 5G Super Blueprint? US government, DARPA, DOD, Ops 5G, and a whole bunch of other projects, okay? What they are doing is they are taking, so first of all, US government basically made a statement after years of theoretical analysis that open source is more secure than closed source and open source is the way we're going to build everything after 5G. Everything from defense systems to, you know, ground surveillance to uh, private, net, private public networks, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and um, they made that statement and they are following through with this. There's a presentation by uh, the, the, the head of DARPA, Tejas Patel, uh, on YouTube under the LF networking channel that you can see on how they were planning to use. So I borrowed a slide from him where he's basically taken a whole bunch of projects and he's looking at how to utilize these projects for their use cases. Now, what are the five use cases? No kidding, right? Ultra low latency, mobile broadband, IMS, network slicing, you know, things like that. So the ones that we all know of. And that's what they want to use everything from, you know, user edge all the way to the core. And then all the research that gets done in the universities like USC, for example, on, on slicing and things like that get put back into upstream so that there is a loop and everybody benefits on that. So this is very important. And a lot of these blueprint work is being uh, done in the open community. So feel free to join and participate in that community. Another very interesting project is Nephio. And now it is part of LF networking. Uh, we have not publicly launched that yet. Nephio was launched a year ago um, where it was um, seed coded by Google. Uh, it is essentially sitting on top of Kubernetes and it's for cloud native network automation, right? So CNFs and things like that. How do you automate it very quickly? And, and it's, in, it's that orange line on top of, of the uh, public cloud and on-prem infrastructure. Everything else, like the VMs, the physical infrastructure, the service orchestration, and the OSS BSS integration happens through ONAP, right? So if you look at the end-to-end -end solutions, Nephew and ONAP complement each other. And, um, and, and it builds on the concepts of CRDs, KRDs, like Kubernetes resource models, and configuration as a data. It is extremely um, hot. And in fact, they just released the R1. Um, I think the QR code still works if you want to download every information on the R1. Uh, but R1 basically had three things. It had a framework to orchestrate CNFs, infrastructure, and cross-domain lifecycle management. That's what the main code was about. It also had sample CRDs and, and, and custom resource, oh, sorry, definitions, right, CRDs and Kubernetes integration. Uh, and as an example, the community did a sandbox 
for 5GC or 5, uh, 5G core that was orchestrated and implemented and integrated in Nephew. Release 2 is being worked, so if you have not, you, you know, you can actually contribute to this join Nephew community and kind of move it forward, but this is a very important project because essentially it is taking all the baggage out from telecom when they move to cloud native and going flat line on the cloud native path, right? There's a lot of hybrid, there's a lot of brown boxes, there's a lot of, I would say, old stuff that's sitting here, which will always be there. But as you, as you get to pure cloud native, you can go straight down into Kubernetes and, and go very, very quickly. Okay. So with that, I am going to say, get on the community if you're not already there. Um, I know, uh, you know, uh, participating is, is relatively easy and mostly free. If you're not a member and want to influence the community, do join. Um, those of you who are just listening for the first time, um, get your LFID and get going. And do see us in person at Open Networking and Edge Summit in Silicon Valley next year. This is a very important event. We're bringing it back to Silicon Valley after years. Um, it started in Stanford, as you know, as ONS, and we took it over and then it has moved its way around. This is one of the regional days today as part of one summit or open networking and edge summit as, as we expand it. Uh, but the CFPs are just gonna be uh, launching very soon. So stay tuned on that, but I expect all of you 400 people who are registered virtually and can't travel to be there, okay? Uh, people in the room, you know, great, thank you for coming. But the, with that, here's a summary. We're at the tipping point, 5G edge and IoT deployments are happening, uh, verticals are pumping up, and we have been working very steadily across both geo geopolitical and macroeconomic headwinds, right? Let's not Let's not underestimate how much, how much those two cause concerns to the other part of the uh, world. We we are, you know, that, I would say let, let's not jinx it, but our community is relatively moving forward. Okay, let's keep this going. All right. So with that, I am almost done.